Hey Optomancers, Tree and Monk here, and so we're going to be talking about 4th level wizard spells today, and we're still in the levels of spells where I think wizards get a lot of dramatic, neat stuff. Uh, they're, with 4th level we get a lot of spells that do things that we've never seen before. We had a similar thing coming up with 3rd level spells, and with 4th level spells there's no difference there. Uh, now some of the 4th level spells do very similar things to 3rd level spells, and some of them not even as well, so we will talk about that, and that does affect my rating. Uh, sometimes there are spells that, in a vacuum, they would be okay spells, but if there's just a better option at a lower level, I just don't see any reason why I would take it or prepare it. Uh, so we're going to be talking about our fourth level spells right now, uh, and it looks like the volume level that I put on the last video was reasonably well received, so I'm going to continue that here. Hopefully that will be a permanent fix. Uh, if not, let me know in the comments down below, but for now, Let's get started. As always, I'm going to be doing my color coding ranking for spells, and as usual, red will mean that the spell is something I don't recommend. Uh, orange will mean that I think the spell is pretty circumstantial. Uh, a lot of people have mentioned that those kind of spells might be good on spell scrolls, and I agree. Uh, and then a purple spell is a spell I think is okay. A green spell is a spell I think is good, and I, I give it a solid recommendation. And then a blue spell I think is almost a must-have for a wizard. Uh, just one of those spells that kind of defines the class. I've had a comment from somebody who suffers from color blindness that they have trouble seeing those colors. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing a star ranking method as well. There will be a little star ranking beside each one. Uh, one for red, two for orange, three for purple, four for green, five for blue. Because I want this channel to be accessible to all possible viewers. Uh, so uh, let's get started with our abjuration spells. As always, I'm going to rank by spell school from top to bottom, my favorite to the least favorite. So my favorite abjuration spell is Banishment. Now, Banishment, I've mentioned this before, I'm not a huge fan of spells that they provide a target a saving throw, and if they save, nothing happens. Uh, now, some of those spells, like other ones we're going to talk about in this list, have other uses as well, and I tend to like those spells more. Uh, but Banishment, that's really the only thing it does. You target one enemy, if they fail their saving throw, which is a charisma save, and that's not bad. But if they fail their saving throw, they are banished, and they go generally to a demi-plane where they're incapacitated for the duration. Uh, and it was pointed out to me, and absolutely true, if they are from another plane, they are sent to that plane. But the important thing is, is if they're sent to that plane, they're not incapacitated. Now, if you maintain the duration of this spell, the full minute duration concentration, they are permanently banished. But if they are a creature that has the ability to travel between planes, they could potentially return, and because they're not incapacitated, they could even potentially return while you're still concentrating on the spell. So keep that in mind. If you have a creature that has plane shift at will or something like that, and it's not from your plane, then banishment isn't going to do much besides remove them for a round. Because there's only one saving throw for this spell, it tends to work well if you're a diviner and you're combining it with portent. Uh, another thing to mention too is if you cast this spell at a higher level, you can affect multiple targets. So you get two targets with a level 5 spell, three targets with a level 6 spell. And then I find that this spell scales reasonably well as long as we're using that method of scaling. My next favorite abjuration spell is Morden Kanan's Private Sanctum, and this is basically a privacy spell. So we use a 10 minute cast, so this isn't a combat spell at all, uh, and then it's going to create a 24 hour duration area, and then we have all kinds of protections to basically to our privacy there. Uh, we're protected from divination spells, but it also affects things that are physical because you create like a mist and sound can't escape. So it can protect you from not only just scrying, but also physical spying on you as well. Uh, and obviously this is going to be pretty circumstantial. There's lots of campaigns, lots of adventures where privacy isn't important at all. But if you are in a campaign where maybe you are being spied on and you're trying to foil it, this is a good way out of that. So it's an orange rating because in those circumstances it's, it's exactly the right spell for you. But in a lot of campaigns, I would think you wouldn't miss it at all if you didn't have it. My least favorite spell 
for the abjuration school is stone skin. So number one, stone skin has a material component cost that is used up every time you cast it. It's 100 gold pieces, that's not a fortune, uh, but if you're casting regularly, that will add up. Secondly, as a buff, I think it is okay. It's gonna give you resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Uh, as a self buff, I'm almost never going to use this. I'm going to try to avoid getting hit rather than get resistance on hits because this is concentration too. So if you're getting hit, of course, it's concentration saves. Now, as a buff on somebody else, sometimes it might be okay. You got a tank character, uh, they're expecting to get beaten on and they don't have resistance from some other method because they're not a barbarian or anything like that, then maybe this as a buff isn't such a bad buff. Uh, so there's circumstances where this is an okay buff, but I don't think this spell is really required for any wizard at all. So let's move into Conjuration, and the favorite spell I have in Conjuration is Dimension Door. Uh, and Dimension Door I've talked about many times before, so I don't want to just keep repeating myself. But basically it's quick get away, we can get somebody else away. If you are a small size caster, be aware that you can't move medium sized creatures, so this spell isn't as good for you, uh, though it can still be good if you are in a group that has other small characters or you just need to get away yourself. Uh, but mainly I would be more inclined to take this with a medium sized character. If you already have the Thunderstep spell, there's redundancy there. I wouldn't prepare both those spells. I pick one or the other. I think Dimension Door is the better spell, but it's also a higher spell level, so I think you're good either way. This is a spell that, at higher levels, I'm going to keep prepared, and because we don't need to upcast it, it's a good use for our fourth level slot, once a lot of these other spells maybe aren't such a good use for our fourth level slot anymore. My next favorite Conjuration spell at this level is Watery Sphere, and what Watery Sphere does is it creates basically a 10 foot wide sphere that we can move into enemy squares and then we can restrain those enemies if they fail their strength saving throw. And then if they're restrained, then we can move this effect and they move with the effect. So that's kind of cool. We can move things around against their will. Because it only covers four squares, it can only contain up to four medium or smaller creatures. Uh, and then if you try to contain any more and they're engulfed, then one of the previous ones is kicked out and they fall prone. So that still might be okay because sometimes the prone condition is okay too. We can also contain one large creature, though I find it generally better against medium creatures because of course we can affect more of them. One interesting thing about this spell is if the target makes their saving throw, it's a strength saving throw, if they make their strength saving throw, then they're not restrained and they're expelled from the effect. And they choose the square they want that is closest and unoccupied. And this can cause some forced movement, uh, so there's some circumstantial uses there. Uh, number one, maybe a creature is in front of a hallway you need access to. So you throw the watery sphere there, and if they make their saving throw, they are pushed to the side. And maybe we move the watery sphere, and then we can go through ourselves. There's other potential, even more effective things we can do circumstantially with that forced movement. So let's take a look at a battlefield, and I'll kind of show you a couple hypotheticals. So if we look here, we have a battlefield, and we're going to assume that this is a rooftop. So you can see the white around the outside, that is the street below or whatever is below, uh, and then the tiles are the rooftop. Now our wizard is going to be this one right here, this person, uh, and they are in a combat with their allies against some various enemies. Now one of those enemies, as we can see, is a huge sized creature. So this is a creature that would automatically make its saving throw against the watery sphere. Now up in the upper right corner, you can see there's a bit of a melee there. So we have three, these green skinned guys are enemies. I'm not sure what race they are. Maybe they're advanced orcs or something. And then the ones with the shields, those are our allies. So right here in the middle, we're gonna have our watery sphere effect. So where could we place it? Well, the first thing we could do is we could place it up here. Now, if we place it up here, we can say there's two of the, we'll call them orcs. Uh, so we'll say there's two orcs there that will have to make a saving throw, strength saving throw, or they'll be restrained. And that will give them disadvantage on attacks and advantage to be attacked. Uh, so that could be useful. Now, another thing we could do is we could put it here. Now, obviously we are potentially hitting one of our allies. Now they're not taking damage. They would just be restrained if they fail their saving throw. But let's take a look a little bit about what would happen to these orcs. Uh, first, this one here. If it fails its saving throw, it would be restrained. And then it's in a lot of trouble because it's in melee range with three of our allies. Uh, would have disadvantage on attacks and advantage to be attacked. Uh, and it wouldn't be able to move. But if it makes its saving throw, 
then it is expelled from the effect, and it has to go to the nearest unoccupied space. And it would have three choices. It could choose there, it could choose there, or it could choose there. So it's going to fall off the roof. Same thing happens with this guy up here. If it makes its saving throw, it's going to be expelled off the roof automatically as well. Only this one here, is there any real advantage to making the saving throw? So with these two orcs on the side, there's no real point in them even trying to make their save. And the spell specifies that you can choose to fail your save, and they probably will. So they'll choose to fail their save, and then they're restrained. Or they're going to make their save, and they're going off the roof. And then they're out of the battle. Only this one up here, is there any point in it even making a saving throw? Because there are a couple unoccupied spaces it can go to where it isn't going to go off the roof. So how much danger are we actually putting our ally in? Not that much. At worst, it's going to have one unrestrained enemy to deal with, and we have two allies who can move right in and take care of that guy. Also, keep in mind that if this orc, say, moves there uh, after making a successful saving throw, on our next turn, we could simply move the effect over there, and it's going to have to make another saving throw. So that is one example where the force movement effect has a pretty dramatic result. Uh, now let's look over here. So here we have a huge sized creature and generally if you read the spell description it sounds like huge sized creatures automatically are not going to have any effect from this. But that's not the case. In the right circumstances it could have an effect. So let's say we move the effect and we put it right there. So now it is in the enemy's square, so it has to make a saving throw that it automatically succeeds. So now it automatically succeeds the saving throw, which means it's expelled from the effect to the nearest empty square. But it can't go anywhere around here because these are not the closest empty squares. The closest empty squares are all off the edge of the roof. Now it depends on your DM. I mean, ultimately the creature is going to move there. So what happens when the creature moves there? Well. I would say as a DM, there's no specific rules to deal with this. I would think there's probably going to be an acrobatics check, and I don't think that a huge creature is going to be good at an acrobatics check, uh, or it might automatically fall off. Uh, some DMs might say it automatically can stay, uh, but I would think that it would at least have disadvantage because it's not in a huge square anymore. Now it's in a large square. So we can see that in the right circumstances, this can even have an effect on a huge or bigger creature. Now obviously, both those circumstances I just pointed out are not going to happen very often, but these are one in a list of many hypotheticals that could come up. I just wanted to kind of show you how the force movement could cause negative effects for enemies even if they make their saving throw. Now, am I using Watery Sphere at high levels? Probably not. This is using our concentration. It's really just a battlefield control effect. Really appropriate for the level we get it uh, at super high levels. Once we can do massive battlefield controls that don't use concentration, uh, this might be useful against weaker enemies, but I'm not sure I would continue to prepare it. My next favorite conjuration spell at this level is Summon Greater Demon. And Summon Greater Demon, I think, is a lot better than Summon Lesser Demons uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, we're getting a lot better creature. Number two, we can now control them. Uh, they do get a Charisma Saving Throw to break the control, and they get one at the end of each turn. Uh, but if we know their true name, they will get disadvantage. And so it's been suggested to me, and I think it's a reasonable choice, that one of the first commands you should give it is to tell you its true name. Now it's getting that Charisma saving throw every round to break control. And a lot of demons also have resistance to magic, so they would get advantage on that. Keep that in mind. Ideally though, because we can pick the creature, we can pick creatures we know are not going to have great Charisma saving throws, so there can be some synergy there and it can be pretty hard for them to save. The thing is though, this is an hour long duration and I'm not sure it's going to last you more than one combat, because if we complete a combat and the creature still hasn't failed a saving throw, how long is it going to be before the next combat? I mean, in some cases it's several minutes. So several minutes, that's like 10 saving throws per minute. Eventually it's going to buck the odds, and eventually it's going to make their saving throw, unless for some reason you are going to have a saving throw DC where they can't possibly succeed. Uh, and that isn't going to be easy to make happen at anywhere near this level. Now if they break your control, they still stick around and they will attack the nearest target. So again, we're going to place this creature on the other side of enemies uh, so it attacks the enemies first. So even if control is broken, we still might get some use out of this spell. 
Now, if you stop concentrating on this spell, that demon's going to stick around for 1d6 more rounds before it disappears. So if you got that demon on the other side of the enemies and it breaks control, it's time to stop your concentration uh, because you'll roll the d6. You'll still have that advantage of that demon and then at some point it's going to disappear, hopefully close to the end of the combat. Now, if the combat does end and you still hold control, then you probably want to consider kind of commands that are going to get this thing out of your way before it does break control. Now, generally around this level, I would expect my wizard to have a spell DC 15 or 16. Uh, so if we can find a creature that doesn't have a good charisma saving throw, that's a pretty hard save to make. So I want to talk about some of the good options here. When we cast a spell, we can pick a demon of challenge rating 5 or lower. Uh, and then if we were to upcast this spell, we could pick one higher challenge rating per upcasting of the spell. The first demon I want to talk about is the Babao. Uh, the Babao is a CR4 uh, demon, which means you might not think it was one of the best options, but it seems to be underrated. The Babao demon should be higher than challenge rating 4. When I compare it to some of the challenge rating 5 demons, it's better. It has great hit points, decent armor class, uh, it's good in combat, and it has all kinds of nice spell-like abilities. Spell-like abilities that are really good. Dispel Magic is on there, Heat Metal is on there, Darkness is on there, Levitate is on there, Fear is on there. These are all at will. Now the DC is really low, but other than the Fear spell, or if it was trying to use Levitate offensively, that shouldn't be a problem. So between good melee attacks, lots of great spell-like abilities at will, uh, lots of hit points, good defense, the Babao Demon is just a great choice uh, with a plus one saving throw to Charisma. The next one I want to talk about is the Bulgura. It's a challenge rating 5 demon. And this one is going to be more of a, just a straight brawler. Uh, the Bulgura doesn't have as good hit points as the Babao demon. Or as good an armor class. Um, but it has kind of a reckless attack thing which is going to increase its offense. And the good thing there is you might be able to get it to be more of a target. So it can take some of the enemy focus away from your frontline fighters. Uh, though I don't expect it to last very long because its hit points aren't quite as good and its armor class isn't quite as good, and it has kind of that reckless attack thing, I would imagine the enemies can chew this thing up reasonably easily. Now it does have a couple spell-like abilities, it has an entangle, and it has a fairy fire. Those might be useful in certain combats, but in general this is more about just doing those reckless berserker attacks on the other side of the enemy to draw their fire. One nice thing is it has a minus one to its charisma saving throw and no resistance on that. Uh, so it is going to be harder for it to break your control. And the next demon I want to talk about is the Tanaruk. And it's kind of like Balgura on steroids. Lots more hit points, better armor class, it's better offensively. Uh, and it also has a minus one on its saving throw. But it does have advantage on those saves because it is resistant to magic. But if you are looking for a crazy raging barbarian on the other side of your enemies, Tanaruk is the option. Now, in terms of upcasting, it gets to the point where the demon's challenge ratings get so high that it's not really viable to be upcasting this. But one good option, I think, is if you were to cast this with a fifth level slot, I think the Vrock is a pretty good option here too. Uh, and what you would want to do with the Vrock is right away on round one and round two, you would use its spores and its stunning screech. Uh, and just get those out of the way. We don't care about the recharge. We don't care about the one a day use. Uh, get them out of the way well. It is in position to hit the enemies, but not you or your allies. Decent way to take care of massive quantities of enemies. And then the Vrock can just wade into combat. It has really good hit points, lots of resistances. So it's not easy to take down. Uh, and it has a decent offense. So once you get those two main abilities out of the way, it's still going to be a decent tank for you for the rest of the battle. Now, how long does this spell scale? Well, once the Vrock is no longer very effective in combat, that's the time that you probably don't want to prepare this spell anymore. My next favorite conjuration spell is Everd's Black Tentacles. And Everd's Black Tentacles is a concentration spell, and it's going to cover a 20-foot square, which is 16 individual squares. Uh, so a moderately sized effect. Uh, and then creatures make their dexterity saving throw, and if they fail their dexterity saving throw, they are restrained for the duration of the spell. And I need to make a correction here, because this spell actually is worded very similarly to the web spell. And when I did my second level video, I mentioned that creatures are getting saving throws every round, and then they can use their ability checks as well. But the wording is a little weird, and what it says is that when the creature begins its turn in the effect, it gets a saving throw, 
but it also says if it fails that saving throw, it's restrained for the duration unless it makes the ability check. So it doesn't actually get that additional save if it is already restrained by the spell. So that's important to note. I did post it in the comments down below on that video, but I wanted to mention it here as well. So the Ivard's Black Tentacles, very similar. If a creature is restrained, it remains restrained unless it can make a strength or dexterity check to break out. Now keep in mind if it has bonuses to saving throws or it has something like legendary resistances, that's not going to help on those ability checks. And we can potentially affect those ability checks with things like hex as well. Also keep in mind this is automatically difficult terrain. I think that's kind of a minor aspect of the spell. But if we are able to use this on prone enemies or we're able to knock them prone when they're in the effect and restrained, uh, if they break that restraint then Keep in mind they have to use half their movement just to stand up so it might be difficult for them to get out of the effect and they may get affected by it the following round now as i mentioned this spell is very similar to web the main differences are web lasts a lot longer though i don't think that really makes a difference i think it's basically irrelevant because it's not a mobile effect so once the battle is over it doesn't matter whether it lasts for one minute or one year uh, and then the second thing is this one will do damage to them every round if they're restrained uh, and that can be pretty good especially if they're in like the middle of the effect or the back of the effect and we can't get to it so they're restrained we would be able to do damage to them but if we can't get to them and we don't want to enter the effect because this will have friendly fire if our allies go into it they are going to be affected by it uh, so this is a way we can continue to do damage to those enemies that are restrained by this spell still is it that much better than web worthy of two additional levels i'm not sure it is uh, so that's why i rate this spell lower than web my next favorite conjuration spell is Conjure Minor Elementals, uh, and there's a couple ways that this is actually better than Summon Greater Demon. Uh, the first thing is that the elementals you summon will not turn against you, uh, and the second thing is, is you can potentially summon more than one elemental. But there are some pretty significant downsides to this spell. Uh, first and most obvious is the casting time. A one minute casting time means it's not a combat spell. We have to cast it outside of combat and then bring those creatures in with us. So the advantage of being able to put up multiple creatures uh, is heavily reduced if we can't just place them. They have to move into position. But there are two much bigger downsides. The first one is the DM picks the creature. And then the second one is that the creature has a very low challenge rating. The maximum challenge rating we can do with this is summon one elemental with a challenge rating two or lower. Keep in mind that summon greater demon, it's challenge rating five or lower. So if we look at our challenge rating two options, uh, really the best thing we could get is a gargoyle. Gargoyle is not too bad, but compare that to a challenge rating five demon and you'll see what I mean. So I don't think this is a terrible summoning spell, but I do think that because of those two things, not having any control over what you get and nothing you get is very tough. The uses of this are going to be pretty circumstantial. One of my least favorite spells for conjuration is Morden Kanan's Faithful Hound. This kind of reads like the alarm spell with a bite attack. Uh, so you create the hound, any creature that comes into range, it's going to start barking and alert you. And then it can bite them on your turn for 48 damage not good damage for the level. Now as a combat spell, it's not entirely useless. Uh, it can see invisible creatures, so it might alert you if an invisible creature comes close and it can potentially do a little bit of damage to it. It also might be useful for detecting illusions because maybe the illusion is a creature and it doesn't attack the illusion. Uh, I don't see that coming up very often. And we have a lot better ways to detect invisibility at this level. Uh, way better ways even at lower levels to detect invisibility so I don't think it's really a great option for that use uh, so although it's not useless there are better options for doing the same thing my least favorite conjuration at this level is Liam secret chest uh, and so the first thing is massive cost on this spell 5,000 gold pieces plus another duplicate for another 50 gold pieces so one time cost but that's a big deal uh, my main problem with this spell, so first let's talk about what the spell does. It creates this chest, you can put your treasure in it, uh, and then it goes to an extra dimensional space where basically it's safe. It can't be stolen, all those kinds of things. Uh, but after 60 days, then it, there's a chance that it will disappear forever. So we never want to use this more than 60 days. So this is a 5,000 gold piece spell that it can protect a small amount of treasure. It's not a big chest either, so we're not filling it with a bunch of 
interesting stuff. Mostly it's going to be useful for coins, scrolls, rings, small kinds of stuff that you don't want to get stolen. Uh, there will be occasions where this will be useful, but I don't think they come up enough for me to recommend this spell. So let's get into our divination spells, and one of the best divination spells for its level in the game is Arcane Eye. Uh, now, we talk a lot about wizard tactics, and I constantly get told that wizards can use spells to determine what's on the other side of the door, and so we can prepare for it, and people don't do that strategy enough. I don't think in most cases that's overly practical. It uses up spell slots. Sometimes that information isn't useful to you. But Arcane Eye, because it's mobile, is another matter entirely. If we're going to enter a system of caverns or a giant's castle, we can send the Arcane Eye and it can just travel around. It's invisible and scout out the entire thing for us. It lasts for an hour. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about being a good player here, because this is something we see sometimes when players get the ability to do some kind of scouting is either they're wild shaping into a spider or something, or they're using an arcane eye, and then they steal the limelight for a long period of time while the DM has to tell them what's in each room. They keep telling the DM where they go. If you want to be a good player here and you want to use arcane eye, I think it's important to get your table involved in the decisions as to where the eye is going to go. Uh, discuss with them about what it sees uh, so that you guys can have some interaction. You need to get the rest of the table involved. If you don't get the rest of the table involved, then this is still a good optimal choice, but you're not necessarily being a good player. Now, one limitation of this spell is it cannot move through walls. It needs at least a gap of an inch. So in certain places, if you have closed doors, they may not have the big enough gap for this to move through. So it can be limited by some factors. Still, even at higher levels, I think this is a useful spell. And I should note too that if you are a diviner, you cast this spell and you can recover a third level spell slot. So then this becomes a pretty cheap thing for you to use. Uh, so for a diviner, I'd say this is a blue spell. My least favorite divination spell this level is Locate Creature. So Locate Creature will tell you the direction of a creature within a thousand feet. You have to have seen it before, so something like a description isn't going to help you. Uh, but if Let's say a party member was taken prisoner and you're trying to locate them. You could use locate creature, and as long as they're in range, you would get a direction. But not necessarily. If they're on the other side of running water, doesn't work. If they've been polymorphed into something else, doesn't work. Uh, also, it's only giving you a direction, so if they're being held in a dungeon, although you might be able to tell kind of the direction they are within the dungeon, you're not going to know how to get into that dungeon or how to get around the maze of tunnels to get to them. Uh, so there's a lot of limitations here. In the right circumstances, this is still the right spell, uh, but I don't think it comes up very often. So let's get into our enchantment spells. Not a lot of good enchantment spells. Uh, I guess my favorite is Charm Monster, and I don't think Charm Monster is a great spell. Uh, what it does is you pick a monster. It can be a human, it could be anything. Uh, so that's the advantage of this over Charm Person. It doesn't have to be a humanoid anymore, it could be a dragon, uh, and they will make a wisdom saving throw, and if they make it, nothing happens. If you're in combat, they will get advantage on that saving throw. So you really don't want to use this in combat. Uh, but if you're out of combat, they make their saving throw. If they fail it, they're charmed by you. And what happens is it's a one hour duration, uses your concentration, the creature gains the charmed effect, which basically means advantage on your social roles and it's not going to attack you, and it is automatically friendly to you. So it's your buddy. Uh, but it is your buddy, not necessarily your allies' buddy. So depending on the kind of situation where you cast this, if you cast it on something that is an enemy to you and your party, it will stop being an enemy to you if it fails at saving throw, but not necessarily to the rest of your party. It might even attack them, and you can't prevent it. It's not like you can give this thing commands. In a lot of ways, I actually like the suggestion spell better than this spell. Now, I should note, if you are an enchanter and you're 10th level or higher, you can target two creatures with this spell, which I think makes it better. I don't think it makes it great, but I would probably consider it a purple spell at that point. That brings us to my least favorite enchantment spell for this level, and that's Confusion. Uh, and this is one of those spells where I talked about spells in a vacuum. If Confusion was the only mass debuff you could get, I'd say it's a decent spell. But with the wizard spell list, Confusion just doesn't belong where it is. It should be a second level spell, not a fourth level spell, because third level mass debuff spells are better. 
Now the range of this spell is 90 feet, which is decent, and then it has a 10 foot radius effect, which is actually smaller than most of these kinds of spells. In fact, if we cast this as a fifth, as a fifth level spell, then it would have the same area of effect as a hypnotic pattern. So obviously we would never do that. Like those spells, it can have friendly fire. Like those spells, it targets wisdom. Unlike those spells, it's gonna give them a saving throw every round. Now, if they fail their saving throw on their turn, what they do is random and you roll the 10. Uh, now there is a 20% chance that they will act normally on their turn. So then that even if they fail their saving throw, this isn't helping you. Uh, there's another 20% chance that they'll attack randomly, which means they may attack your allies, which also isn't very good. So now there's a 40% chance on their turn that they might do something bad to you or your allies, uh, even if they fail their saving throw. Now, one thing I should mention is confused creatures, even if they act normally, at least lose their reactions. Uh, but overall, this spell, as a mass debuff doesn't deserve to be a fourth level spell because there are third level spells that are mass debuffs that have bigger areas provide less saving throws and have more dramatic effects uh, so i just can't recommend this spell so let's get into the evocation spells my favorite evocation spell for this level is auto luke's resilient sphere uh, and the reason i like this spell a lot is because it is so versatile uh, all the effects of it are okay but you get so many different effects that I think overall it becomes a very good spell. So what it does is it creates a sphere that encloses a large or smaller creature. And basically it's kind of like a little wall of force where it can't be penetrated by any means. Uh, so the creature can't get out. No one else can get in. No one can attack each other. So the uses of this spell are multifold. If we use it on an enemy, they get a dex saving throw. If they make their dex saving throw, nothing happens. And I kind of assume the sphere doesn't appear at all. But if they fail their saving throw, they're encased in the sphere. And other than moving around, they can't really do much. Uh, maybe they can heal, maybe they can self buff, uh, but most creatures don't really have options like that. So they're basically out of the fight. And now we can deal with the other enemies and then deal with them last. Uh, the other use of this is protection for either yourself or your allies. So there's an ally, he's been surrounded, now he's gonna take a beating and probably go down, maybe even die. You can use the Autoluke's Resilient Sphere to protect him and prevent him from dying. We could also use it on ourselves if maybe our defensives have gone down or being rushed by enemies, or we're expecting some kind of effect that's gonna do massive amounts of damage to us. We can use this to protect ourselves. It does use our concentration and we can't do much out of it. So there's not a lot of point in casting it if we still need to be effective in a combat. Once we do this, we've kind of taken ourselves out of the combat. But if it's a choice of doing this or dying, I'll do this every time. The final use here is this can be combined with a contingency spell. It's not my favorite spell to combine with a contingency spell, but it's pretty good. Uh, so what you would do is you're targeted with an enemy attack and the contingency goes off and then the Autolux Resilient Sphere protects you and keeps you protected until you can get yourself out of harm's way. So as I said, a lot of different uses here. None of them are amazing on their own, but you put them all together and I think you have a pretty solid spell. My next favorite evocation spell is Fire Shield. Uh, and Fire Shield is an action cast that's going to give you resistance to fire or cold damage for 10 minutes. Uh, because it doesn't use concentration, I kind of like it. Uh, only really useful if we know that we might face fire or cold damage. Uh, but if we do, then that resistance all the time means we can save our reactions and we don't have to constantly use the Absorb Element spell. Uh, now, technically speaking, if a creature hits you with a melee attack while you have this up, they take a little bit of damage. For the most part, I want to avoid getting hit in combat, and the damage isn't that great, so I consider this mostly irrelevant. But if I am playing some kind of melee wizard, like we have maybe our Abjur build, and they're like a deep gnome using their non-detection to constantly raise that Abjuration shield, and maybe they're taking significant amounts of damage in combat, and that's okay, well then the fire shield might end up doing a reasonable amount of damage as well. So there might be specific builds and cases where that damage to creatures that hit you might come into play more often. For the most part, I'm not considering that when I use this spell. I'm using it as a defensive buff for my wizard that's not gonna use my concentration. And because it's not gonna use my concentration and we don't have to upcast it, it's something I might keep on my list at a higher level. 
I was even thinking, and this is just theoretical, I wouldn't recommend this build, but if you were, say, something like a Barbarian Wizard, you could cast Fire Shield, and because it's not concentration, you could maintain it as a Barbarian, and then you rush into combat because you're a big tank, uh, and you rage, and then you're getting attacked all the time because you're reckless attacking, and then you're not taking a lot of damage because of the rage, and you're also dealing a lot of damage to the enemies through the fire shield. Would be kind of an interesting thing. In general, I think that's a terrible multi-class. I would never recommend it. Uh, it was just a combination I thought of that. I thought if you were in a situation where you wanted to have a really unusual character, you could do that and it would be kind of interesting. My next favorite evocation spell this level is Wall of Fire. And as a blast spell, I think Wall of Fire is so-so. It's going to create a wall 60 feet long, and then creatures take 5d8 damage if they're in the effect or they begin their turn near the effect. Uh, that tends to be about 23 points of damage. We can do it as a wall. We can do it as a ring around the party as well if we want. It does block vision. Uh, that might be useful sometimes. In general, I don't think this is doing a huge amount of damage especially since creatures have to end their turn near the effect to take damage. So we're not necessarily expecting continual damage here. Uh, it's immobile, so if creatures can avoid it, they probably just will. And it's using up our concentration. So there's a number of downsides here, but it has a decent size. Uh, the damage isn't terrible. So overall, if you want to concentrate on blasting, I think it's okay. My next favorite evocation spell is Storm Sphere. And what that storm sphere does is it creates a 20 foot radius effect. And if creatures fail a strength saving throw, it could take some pretty minor damage. But keep in mind, 20 foot radius and there is friendly fire here. So we probably don't want to be casting it anywhere near our allies. Uh, then this does use our concentration. And we keep it up. Creatures that remain in that area continue to take damage. Now, now the big thing here is as a bonus action on our turn, we can make an attack with a lightning bolt. Uh, and it affects a single target for 46 damage, which isn't a whole lot of damage, to be honest. Uh, but we make an attack roll, and if they're in the area of effect, then we get advantage on that attack roll. Now, I would point out that a Flaming Sphere, upcast as a 4th level spell, will do about the same amount of damage using our bonus action every round. Uh, but the thing here is that a Storm Sphere, at least, it has a little more versatility in where it attacks, because it can attack one person like who's way over here one round, and then who's way over there the next round, and you can't do that with the Flaming Sphere. Uh, and then you have that initial area where they're taking some damage. And if you can somehow restrain them in that area, maybe you can combine something with another party member, like a Everett's Black Tentacles, and then you throw a Storm Sphere over top, and those might combine reasonably well as well. I should mention two other things. Uh, the first is, if you are an Evoker, Sculpt Spells is going to be pretty useful here, uh, because then you could put it like right over your party, and then they're not going to take damage from it, and then the enemies will. Uh, the second thing I want to mention is it scales reasonably well, because it adds d6 to both effects. So we can potentially be adding 2d6 damage around to our enemies. And so if this spell lasts for a number of rounds, that could be pretty good. My next favorite evocation spell at this level is Sickening Radiance. Uh, now, Sickening Radiance, I don't think it's an amazing spell, but at least it does have some unique effects that we don't see very often. So it creates a 30-foot radius sphere that does move around corners. So that's a good size, and that's kind of a unique mechanic. Second thing that happens is if creatures enter the area or start their turn there, they get a constitution saving throw. And if they make it, nothing happens, and not overly fond of that. But if they do fail their saving throw, they take 40-10 radiant damage, which would be about 21 points of damage. That's not great damage, but it is potentially continuous damage. It also prevents them from gaining advantage from being invisible because they start shedding light. Uh, so it can reveal invisible enemies or just prevent enemies from becoming invisible. And then the final thing is, is if they fail their saving throw, they gain a level of exhaustion. Now, one level of exhaustion is generally not a big deal, but here's where I think this spell could be effective. If you combine it, with something else that can restrain them in the area. So somebody else casts a web spell, and then you were to cast this spell, and you were able to get a bunch of creatures restrained in the area, or maybe you cast it on an area that is kind of a bolt hole for a creature, somewhere you can't get inside or something like that. Uh, you do not want to be stacking exhaustion effects. One level of exhaustion is no big deal. Six levels of exhaustion, you're dead, and it doesn't matter how many hit points you have. Three levels of exhaustion, and you've suddenly got disadvantage on your saving throws versus the effect of this spell. So even if you get to that point, this spell is really, really screwing you. So 
if we were to work this in a careful way, maybe with some combinations with other spellcasters, this could be a very effective spell. But I think that planning kind of has to occur. If we're just kind of using it as an offensive spell, I don't think we're going to see a lot of effect from it. My next favorite evocation spell at this level is Vitriolic Sphere. Uh, and this is kind of a similar spell to Fireball. Uh, the big difference is, is it does acid damage and it spreads the damage over two rounds. But they're going to get a deck save, it covers the same amount of area. Uh, on the first round they actually take less damage than you would expect a fireball to do. And then on the second round, if they take that second round damage, and they don't take it if they made their first saving throw, they only take it if they failed their saving throw, then we would expect Vitriolic Sphere to do more damage than a fireball, even a fourth level cast fireball. Still, is that that great? I mean, didn't I just mention in the last video, I don't think upscaling fireballs makes for a great spell. So when we take spells that are higher level and we say, but if you cast a fireball at this level, this does more damage than a fireball, I don't find that overly compelling. And it's not a lot more damage than a fourth level fireball. Uh, so overall, I think this is a worse spell. The reason I rate it orange instead of red is because it does acid damage. And there's a lot of creatures that are resistant or immune to fire damage. And this does give you a blast option. I think overall, a pretty inferior blast option to a fireball. But a blast option that can do acid damage. And that is far less often resisted or immune. Now, if we scale this spell... It adds 2d4 to the base damage, which theoretically, if a creature also fails at saving throw, is going to effectively be about as much as 3d4 damage. Uh, that's not terrible scaling. I'm not sure that's good enough scaling for me to recommend upcasting this spell. My least favorite evocation spell at this level is Ice Storm. So Ice Storm's another blast spell, and I think it's our worst option at this level for blast spells. Covers the same area that a fireball would do, but it does less damage than a fireball would do. Uh, and it's going to be a mix of cold and bludgeoning damage. So the damage types aren't so appealing that that makes it worthwhile to be doing less damage than a fireball. And less than a third level fireball, by the way. You're going to do less damage. You're going to use a higher level spell slot. And that's going to be pretty disappointing. Now you get one round of difficult terrain. But one round of difficult terrain, I'm sorry, it's just not a big deal. Uh, not nearly worth the various disadvantages this spell has versus, a, say, a fireball. So let's get into our illusion spells. My favorite illusion spell at fourth level, Greater Invisibility. Greater Invisibility is just a good solid buff. You cast it on an ally, and all attacks against them are going to have disadvantage, and all attacks they make have advantage. Uh, so this can be particularly useful if we play it very smart with our allies. We get somebody who maybe has elven accuracy and we cast this on them. That could be really good, especially if they have lots of attacks. Uh, of course, we can give our rogue automatic sneak attack with this. Uh, we could even just use it on ourselves as a defensive buff uh, and then attack with other attack spells, uh, though I don't think that's the best use. I think the best use of this is to cast it on somebody else because generally they're going to be able to make more use of it than we are because they're going to have attacks that are really going to benefit from advantage. Now, if we are a melee wizard and we're doing something like Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade, this might be more useful as a self buff in that case. Now at higher levels, I don't think this holds up. I'm not sure it's worth your concentration for advantage and disadvantage on one creature when we're at higher level. So I'm not sure I keep this on my prep list into those double digit levels, but certainly at level seven, eight, nine, I think this is a pretty good buff for you to have. My next favorite illusion spell is Hallucinatory Terrain. And this is a 10 minute casting, uh, covers a pretty big area and Basically, we can make natural effects illusionary. So we could have an illusionary bog or an illusionary chasm. Uh, it's got to be natural. We can't do structures or anything like that. And we can't affect structures. Uh, because this is a 10-minute cast, because this is immobile, this is automatically going to be super circumstantial. Uh, basically, we need to be in an area. We're expecting something to come into that area that we are going to get benefit by creating illusions. Uh, so if we're being attacked by an enemy and we know where they're going to be attacking us and we have time to cast this spell, we could cast it and then we could create various terrain effects that might be to our advantage. If we are an illusionist, we could potentially use malleable illusions during that combat to change those effects in a way that is advantageous to us. So it might be even a little bit better for an illusionist wizard. Uh, but because of the duration of the casting and the fact that it's immobile, I just don't see it coming up very often. My least favorite spell at fourth level, and I'm not talking about my least 
favorite illusion spell. My least favorite spell at fourth level is definitely Phantasmal Killer. Uh, Phantasmal Killer is just terrible, terrible spell. Here's what Phantasmal Killer does. Now keep in mind, as I mentioned this, this is a fourth level spell that uses your concentration. Okay, I'm gonna pick one creature. They are gonna make a wisdom saving throw. If they make that saving throw, nothing happens. If they fail their saving throw, they are frightened for one round. Now at the end of that round, then they are gonna make a second saving throw. If they fail that second saving throw in a row, they're gonna take a little bit of damage and be frightened for another round and repeat. That is terrible. That is so bad. Consider that the fear spell is a third level spell. That spell gives you one save. You don't get saving throws every round and it affects multiple creatures. Uh, the only reason why we would ever use this spell is because we want that little bit of psychic damage to be adding on, but they have to fail two saving throws before they take their first point of that damage. So we're probably not gonna see any of that damage anyways. Just throwing your fourth level slot away. Uh, I can't even think of the circumstance where this is a spell I'd want. So let's get into our necromancy spells. There's only one necromancy spell at this level, and I don't like it. It's Blight. Uh, as usual, we are gonna see that the designers don't seem to like necromancy because Blight is not a very good spell. We are going to target a single creature and it is gonna get a constitution saving throw. If it fails that saving throw, expect to do about 36 points of damage. If it makes it, about half that. That's not good damage for a fourth level spell. That's not good damage for a fourth level melee character. Uh, but when we're using a fourth level spell slot, we would expect something dramatic to happen. And whether they make their saving throw or they don't, and there's a reasonable chance they will because it's constitution, then this is going to disappoint, 100%. Now, what about against plants? Because Blight is specialized against plants. Well, if we are fighting a plant creature, then it will automatically do maximum damage and they have disadvantage on their saving throw. So now we're talking about 64 points of damage if they fail their saving throw or half that if they make it. So that is actually decent damage for the level for a single target, but it's only against plants and it's not overwhelming damage. And plant creatures just don't come up that much. So are we really going to prepare a spell for a circumstance that probably will never happen? Uh, because in that case, it's decent. I, I don't see it. I mean, maybe if it was overwhelmingly good against plant creatures, but it's not. It's good against plant creatures, but not good enough, especially considering that plant creatures don't come up very often. Now, we can use this to automatically destroy a plant that is non-magical and not alive. So you wanna destroy the bush. You can use a fourth level slot and do it automatically with this spell. Now, even if you're a necromancer and you're hoping to take advantage of Grim Harvest, unless you're going to be wandering into the den of a bunch of shambling mounds, I would not recommend this spell. So let's get into our transmutation spells. Obviously my favorite is gonna be Polymorph. Talked about Polymorph so much, I don't wanna talk about it too long here because you've heard this all before. But as a buff on an ally, it's great because you can turn them into a giant ape, they get 132 hit points, they get decent attacks, they get ranged attacks. We wanna cast it on an ally that is in trouble because their hit points are getting low, then we give them all these new hit points. So instead of the Dimension Door or the Resilient Sphere tactics that we've already talked about, instead of pulling an ally out of combat to safety, instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna change them into a creature where they can continue to be effective in combat. This is more fun too, right? Because a player is gonna have a lot more fun if they can continue fighting in combat rather than being pulled out of combat and now they have to try to figure out ways to heal themselves. Uh, it's gonna be more fun and more effective. Now we can also use it on enemies and we can turn them into a, a snail and then our familiar can pick up that snail and fly him up to a super high height and they can drop him or maybe they can fly him to the ocean and drop him in the ocean or into a volcano. Uh, it really depends on the terrain, but even if you drop them from a high height, they can take 20 D6 damage from that or you just keep them out of combat. But with that use, if they make their save, nothing happens. So that makes this a good one for diviners if they're using portent to make them fail that save because they only get one saving throw. Uh, so like a banishment, only one saving throw, except we have that great buff right on top of it. So polymorph is just an amazing spell. Now polymorph does not scale well because we can't cast it at a higher level for greater effect. So 
eventually that giant ape isn't that great. And the giant ape has terrible armor class, so it's going to take a beating. You got creatures that do tons of damage, and you might not be saving an ally for very long by polymorphing them into a giant ape. So for me, at level 7, this is the best spell in the game. Uh, level 8, level 9, still a pretty good spell, but at level 10, level 11, now I'm not sure a great ape is good enough. And there's just not any better creatures. There's also the T-Rex, but the T-Rex actually has less hit points than the giant ape. And offensively, it's not necessarily better unless it's surrounded. So uh, giant ape is really your best thing. You can do it right away. And as you level up, that becomes less and less effective. I would say level 10 or level 11 is the point to drop this spell. My next favorite transmutation spell at this level is Stone Shape. Uh, so what you do is you take stone and then you can shape it. Uh, the main two uses of this spell are, number one, you are at a wall, you need to get through the wall. You can use Stone Shape and create a gap. Uh, number two, if you are in a gap in a wall and you want to close it, you can use Stone Shape and close it up. Those are kind of the two main uses. There's going to be some circumstantial uses. There's going to be some utility uses for this. Uh, but when I've seen this spell used, it's usually for one of those two things. So my next favorite transmutation spell at this level is Control Water. And Control Water has all kinds of circumstantial effects, but they're all really circumstantial. Uh, so I'm going to provide you kind of a non-exhaustive list of examples here. So the first thing we can do is we can create a flood. So we take a body of water and we can raise it up to 20 feet higher. So if we think about maybe there is a coastal town we want to attack, or maybe there's an enemy stronghold that's beside a lake and we want to kind of flush the enemies out of there, we could use the flood to do that. Uh, also, if we do it on a large enough body of water, we create a tidal wave and that can have other useful effects. But one way or the other, when we're using the flood effect, we're probably talking about kind of sabotaging a static location. The next effect is part water. So part water, we're going to use it to cross a body of water. Now, at third level, we maybe got water breathing, or maybe somebody in the party has water walking. I mean, we could technically have water walking too, uh, because we found in a spell book. I'm never going to choose water walking over water breathing, by the way. Uh, but if we found in a spell book, I'd certainly copy it down and then we cast it as a ritual. The thing about part water, though, is if the body of water contains some kind of aquatic creatures that we really don't want to fight, part water would be a good way for us to avoid that fight. Uh, but for the most part, I think those other spells are far more efficient ways to cross bodies of water. Then we have redirect flow, and this just changes the flow of water. So the main uses here is, let's say you're on a riverboat, so you can change the current of the river and go the other direction, uh, or maybe on a ship that's useful to you. But I wonder if there might be uses like if we have a waterfall flow upwards and, and the spell says specifically we can do that. A lenient DM might even allow you to swim up that waterfall. Uh, so you may be able to find some creative uses as well. And then finally, there's the whirlpool. And this is something we would use if we're in an aquatic adventure or a seafaring adventure. Uh, and then we can use it kind of as a battlefield control. Uh, but all in all, a number of things that could be useful in the right circumstances. I don't think those circumstances are going to come up enough for me to give this anything more than an orange rating, though. My next favorite transmutation spell at this level is Fabricate. And what it does is it takes a bunch of one material and changes it into another form. I did a Forge Cleric video last week where I talked a bit about Fabricate. And in general, I don't think it's an amazing spell. It can be useful for some things, but it's all utility use, and I don't think it's going to come up very often. So it is an orange rating. And then my least favorite transmutation spell in this level, and the only spell I would say that could possibly compare with the amount of crap that Phantasmal Killer is, Elemental Bane is. So what happens with this spell is you pick one target, they lose resistance to a certain energy type, and if they take damage of that energy type, they take 2d6 extra damage. So the idea would be that maybe if you were a blaster, you could cast on somebody and then you could start hitting them with some kind of energy damage. Or maybe combined with another blaster character, you might be able to soften up enemies for them. And if what I just described was the exact spell, I might rate it orange. But I left out a little nugget for you. If the creature makes a constitution saving throw, nothing happens. So if they fail their saving throw, you get this little minor effect. And if they make their saving throw, nothing happens. Uh, kind of reminds me of Phantasmal Killer. Both of them. If they make their saving throw, nothing happens. If they fail, it's not all that effective. So Elemental Bane, like Phantasmal Killer, piece of crap spell. And that's my fourth level list. Do you have any disagreements? I'd love to hear them. 
Uh, let's talk about spells down in the comments down below. And until next time, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to relax and I'm going to have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, Optimancers, and I'll see you next time.